Thank you for joining us on the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. I pray that your time spent with us today will prove to be a great blessing in your life. In Jesus' name, uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will keep us, guide us, and use us in your service as we produce this video. You're in control, so order our steps uh, through your word and give us the right attitude that you may get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, our subject for today is confidence, and it grows out of some of our previous uh, messages. Uh, we are dealing with loving the Father now, and we, one way that you can tell that uh, we are growing in that love for the Father is by the way that we display confidence, the right confidence, not the wrong confidence, but there's a right biblical confidence. And then the second one is uh, uh, honesty, the way we display honesty in our lives. And the third one is the way that we display joyful obedience. And then the last one is victory, the way we celebrate victory, not that what we have done, but what the Lord has done for us. Our text today is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. I'm reading the English Standard Version, and verse 17 reads, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in uh, this world. Verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden? Well, keep listening and we'll, we'll, we'll include uh, that situation as we go. Uh, maybe as a child, you saw a parent or guardian coming your way, and at that moment, you rem remember that you had been instructed to do something that you actually had not done. At that moment, fear of or loss of confidence is what, uh, in what you could do then takes over, and you experience uh, failure in your life and fear, torment of what is going to happen. Or maybe on your job, you were given instruction by your supervisor to complete a certain task, and when you saw your supervisor coming and you hadn't done what you had been instructed to do, fear overcame you of the possibility of what could happen. The possibility of being fired even. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, uh, it reads, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it and uh, of, the, of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then verse seven says, then the woman, the, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves lawn cloth. Now we normally have confidence uh, in our abilities and we fail to follow the right prescribed manner in uh, maintaining confidence. In the Garden of Eden so story, uh, obedience, joyful obedience was a way that, to maintain their confidence and their trust that God was working all things out. He had provided tremendously for them. He had, he had created them. He had given them the perfect setting and the perfect, everything in the garden was perfect. And they disobeyed him. He had said in chapter 2, verse uh, 16 and 17, of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat thereof. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They disobeyed him, and fear and torment took over 
in their lives, fearing what was going to happen. They hid themselves out of fear. Now, there's a different view of confidence found in the Bible. In other words, to view, uh, in order to view confidence correctly as a Christian, we must bring another word uh, into our vocabulary, one we're familiar with, humility. Now, fasten your seatbelt. We are about to experience some turbulence. Humility means two things specifically as we deal with confidence. Humility, number one, is a capacity for self-criticizing. Being able to, to point out to yourself what is not good, what's wrong with you. Being able to criticize yourself and take it. A good friend ought to be allowed by you to criticize you, to point out your shortcoming, the problems that they see in your life. If they're your friends, they will do it. If you're their friends, you will allow them to do it. If you want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will allow them to criticize you. The second thing is uh, allowing others to shine. In order to allow someone else to shine, you've got to not be centered on you shining. Too often, we are concerned, we are engulfed, we are overtaken by the desire to shine. Uh, usually on my calendar, I always put four things. I move it from month to month that uh, we have to be careful uh, that we don't seek opportunities or always shine. We're not always whining. We're not, that, that's whining about this and that. Uh, we're not always reclining. That's lazy. And uh, the next one, I forget at the time. But we've got to learn to be able to allow others to shine. We got to learn how to affirm others, to make them feel about good about what they're doing, their lives. And we have to learn to empower them and enable them to be the best person that they can be. That's being our brother's keeper. Now, those who lack humility are usually dogmatic and egotistical. That makes a deep uh, uh, sense of insecurity. They feel the success of others is at the expense of their own fame and glory. That's a, that's a statement that was made by Cornell West, a professor at one of the universities up in the Northeast section of the United States. Again, I'll repeat it. Uh, a person that's uh, egotistical and dogmatic uh, uh, feel that uh, the success of others uh, uh, should be denigrated in order for them to be successful. Jesus said, I came to serve and not be served. That's the opposite of the way we think a lot of times. On Resurrection Sunday morning, I'm going to focus on the servant resurrection. Jesus, in, in, in that setting, he, he sets the right example for us to, uh, by giving uh, his self to service. And he humbled himself. But... Look at the outcome. He was given a name above every other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lord and King of King. Now, two brand new words come into John's vocabulary here. Fear and torment. And note that John is writing to believers. Now, the question comes to view now, is it possible for Christians to actually live in fear uh, and torment? The answer is yes, unfortunately. Many professed believers experience both fear and torment day by day. And the reason is that they are not growing in the love of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace 
to help in times of need. The word boldness can mean confidence or freedom of speech. It does not mean defiance, freedom to, to live in defiance or assertiveness, taking control. Everybody wants to be in control, but nobody wants to let the Lord be in control or give the Lord control over our lives. A believer who experiences perfecting love grows in his confidence towards God's ability. Uh, 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 we have a rever reverential fear of God, but not a tormenting fear. We as his sons, uh, we have to respect our Heavenly Father not like a prisoner who cringes before a judge of a harsh sentence. We have to, uh, we've adopted uh, uh, some Greek words uh, in our English vocabulary for fear. And it's, it, it springs from phobias. All sorts of phobias are listed in psychological uh, or psychology books. For instance, acrophobia which is a fear of height, height. Uh, hydrophobia, a fear of water. Uh, there's fears of uh, dark or close spaces, uh, uh, fear of walking across a line as we go. Uh, but John, as we have already mentioned in 1 John uh, 2 and 28, now deals with this new type of phobia, Chrisphobia. Spells K-R-I-S-I-S, Chris's phobia, which means the fear of judgment. Uh, and we'll look at it a little bit more. 1 John 2 and 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If people are afraid, it's because of something in the past that haunts them, or something in the present that upsets them, or something in the future that they feel threatens them. Or it could easily be a combination of all three. A believer in Jesus Christ does not have to fear the past, present, or future because we have experienced the love of God, and this love is being perfected in us day by day. It is appointed to man once to die, but after that, the judgment, that's Hebrews 9 and 27. But a Christian does not have to fear judgment because Christ has suffered his judgment for him on the cross. John chapter 5, verse 24, New American Standard Version, and few next few verses will be from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, John 5 and 24 says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Then Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For a Christian, judgment is not a uh, uh, is not future, it's a past event. Our sins have been judged already on the cross and they will never be brought against him again. Uh, the secret to our boldness is as he is, so are we in this world. We know that we shall be like him when he returns. But that statement refers primarily to the glorified bodies believers will receive, as stated in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Positionally, we are right now as he is. We are God's child. Christians means like Christ. The name was first given at Antioch uh, to Christ's followers. We are all we are we are so closely identified with Christ as members of his body that our position in this world is like his exalted position in heaven. 
We are peculiar treasures to God. We are a royal priesthood. And this means that the father deals with us just like he deals with his own beloved son. He loves us. So how can we ever be afraid? We do not uh, have to be afraid of the future because our sins were judged in Christ when he died on the cross. The father cannot judge our sins again, again without judging his son. For as he is, so are we in this world. We do not have to be afraid of the past because he first loved us. From the very first, our relationship with God was one of love. It was not that we loved him, but that he loved us. Romans 5 and 10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And if God loved us when we were outside of the family disobeying him, how much more does he love us now that we are his children? We do not need to fear the uh, present because perfect love casts out fear. And as we grow in the love of God, we cease to fear, uh, uh, to be fearful of what he will do to us. Now, of course, we, there is a proper fear of God, but it's not the kind of fear that produces torment. Romans chapter eight, chapter eight, verse 15 says, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, our Father. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is actually the beginning uh, of torment. And we torment ourselves as we contemplate what lies ahead. Many people suffer deeply when they contemplate even a visit to the dentist or surgery. Think of how an unsaved person must suffer as he contemplates the day of judgment. But since a Christian has confidence in the day of judgment, we can have confidence as uh, we face life even today. For there is no situation of life today that begins to compare with the terrible gravity or seriousness of the day of judgment. God wants his children to live in an atmosphere of love and confidence not of fear and torment. We don't need to fear life or death because we are being perfected in the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or perils or swords? But in all these things we are overwhelming, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and then uh, verse 37 through 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Imagine, nothing at all in all creation, present or future, can come between us and God's love. The perfecting of God's love in our lives is usually a matter of several stages. When we were lost, we lived in fear and knew nothing of God's love. But after we trusted in Christ, 
we found a perplexing mixture of both fear and love in our hearts. But as we grow in fellowship with the Father, and gradually fear starts to vanish, and our hearts become controlled by his love alone. An immature Christian is tossed between fear and love, while a mature Christian rests in God's love. A growing confidence in the presence of God is one of the first evidences that our love for God is maturing. But confidence never stands alone. It always leads to other moral results. Our confidence reminds us of who, who's, who, of who we are and whose we are. Our confidence grows each time we remember Calvary, where Jesus hung, bled, and died for our sins. And what we have referred to as Easter Sunday is becoming Resurrection Sunday. Why? Because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. And that gives us fear each time we think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's more to come, but for now, that's all I've got for today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the renewing of the idea of confidence. And, and um, we thank you for being concerned that our confidence in your love for us continues to grow. And if we are confident in your love for us, then we can be confident in our love for you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Son that has done and is doing what we need to be done in our lives to make us the people that you would have us to be, your children. And we pray, Father, that we would demonstrate this love for others and our love for you as we go from day to day. In Jesus' marvelous name we pray. Amen. Remember to continue to mask up. I think last week I said something that has changed or I took it wrong. I said after you have completed your vaccine, the receiving of your vac vac vaccine, uh, then after two weeks you didn't have to wear your mask. Well, change that. Where you plan on wearing your mask, uh, for some time into the future until there's enough people have received the vaccine for what they're calling herd immunity to take place when there's more uh, people that have been immune and can resist the uh, uh, virus. One of the things that I read today that was uh, informative to me is that uh, even though we take the vaccine, it's possible to uh, not be overtaken by the vaccine, or I mean overtaken by the, the, by the virus, but it is uh, possible to possibly be spreading it and not knowing it. So we've got to be concerned about ourselves and for others. So continue to wear the mask. Oftentimes I find myself in situations where uh, people think I'm wearing the mask for my safety but I often tell them that it's not just for my safety, it's for yours also. And that's a form of love when we can be selfless and not selfish. So continue to wear the mask and, ma and uh, practice social distancing, washing your hands often, and uh, we'll get through this. Uh, take care, love you, and uh, with that, I'm out of here. Bye-bye.